Good afternoon. My name is Jim Shepherd. Thank you for attending this special webinar on the housing implications of the Coronavirus Act from the possession proceedings angle. We're going to produce a further webinar, uh, well, further webinars, in fact, on subjects such as homelessness and other particular areas that are affected by the current crisis. I hope you're all managing to keep well through these difficult times, wherever you are. It is an overused phrase in the media, particular, particularly that these are unprecedented times for us as housing practitioners. We're having to worry about our clients' welfare, as well as the welfare uh, of ourselves and our, uh, our families. There's obviously some concern that the temporary effect on our workload of the measures in the Act and practice direction uh, may put our respective practices at risk. But certainly my view is that the Act and the practice direction uh, are merely putting a halt on possession proceedings. Uh, they're not going away and we will be needed at the end of all of this uh, when uh, I, I say that there will be a tsunami of cases, uh, people who are in arrears uh, uh, that are built up during the crisis and uh, will need assistance, urgent assistance afterwards. You're going to hear from John Hob uh, Hobson in Manchester, uh, and then you're going to hear from Martin Westgate in London. Uh, Daniel Clark and I also will be waiting in the wings to assist with the Q&A at the end. For those of you who uh, are new to Zoom, Zoom, which I certainly am, and haven't attended a webinar before, you will notice that your mics are muted and your videos are off. That's a pre-setting, so please don't be alarmed. It just stops any background interference that we have. Um, you will see that there's a Q&A function. We're asking that you use this rather than uh, the raise hand function um, in order to, to raise questions. And we'll try and deal with as many of the Q&A questions uh, as possible at the end of the session. Um, so please don't hesitate to send your questions through. Uh, using the Q&A uh, uh, function. We're recording this session, so a copy will be available after for you and any colleagues that were unable to attend. Uh, so on that note, I'll go over to John Hobson. Thanks, Jim, and welcome everybody. Um, and indeed, just to follow on, um, from what Jim was uh, saying was that, um, just, just let me try and get onto the first slide. There we go. This virus act itself and received royal assent on the 20th of March 2020. And it's just but three to four weeks ago, of course. And it seems almost like an age uh, gone by already. Um, in the crisis, uh, we're seeing unprecedented all sorts of packages of intervention uh, being put into place. And the background um, was, uh, prior to the Act itself, was the headlines within the packages that the government was putting forward on the 18th, promising that there would be no evictions during this crisis and emergency legislation would follow. So the bill swiftly then before Parliament on the 23rd of March. And that primarily focused, and we'll be looking at in a little bit more detail on this, um, on extensions to required notices for possession to the principal housing um, statute. So Rent Act 77 and of course the 85 and 88 Housing Acts. And uh, extension of such pos uh, requiring possession through to September the 30th 2020 and that really is one of the uh, key dates just to bear in mind as we go through uh, what has emerged and materialized um, as indeed um, as we go through and start to think and as Martin will pick up and as Jim said to use it was his term the tsunami uh, perhaps that we'll see in due course and I think really that's part of where we want to go to today is to look um, at these provisions and and the fertile territory and the issues that might emerge as we uh, go uh, go through the months to come, particularly down through that end of the 30th of September. 
the uh, next significant matter was the uh, intervention. Just let me try and move the next slide. Hang on. Okay. Here it is. The 27th of March, the Master of the Rolls with the Lord Chancellor's agreement had stayed the whole ongoing possession actions for CPR 55, and all possessions seeking to enforce an order for possession by way of warrant or possession for a period of 90 days. And that really came about, I would say, through all kinds of really proactive intervention um, and articulation of the matters to, that, that were important, away from that original headline on the 18th of March, um, to actually uh, translate this uh, practice direction via CPR 51-2. Um, and by calculation delving into CPR 2 about clear days and so on, uh, our calculation is that that means uh, that matters may ostensibly be back to normal, uh, the stay having been listed on Friday, the 26th of June. It's important to say within that provision of those stays uh, and, and uh, in relation to all matters of possession uh, under CPR 55, which will encompass, of course, um, matters that are perhaps not too, for example, under the Mobile Homes Act. Is important also for one's uh, liberty or a tenant's liberty, um, but nevertheless, may, may present in relation to absolute grounds of possession if indeed there is um, a breach of an injunction that is reached for in this current coming period and emerges later on. The idea in relation to um, the stay uh, and indeed um, the spirit of that is to enable people to follow the health guidance uh, being put down on non-restriction uh, restriction of movement and of course not including uh, attending court covers all tenancies, mortgage, trespasses and those licenses covered by the protection from eviction but doesn't <laughs> include those that are excluded from protection. Um, under section 3a so for well including people in interim accommodation but also for example um, live uh, with a landlord who lives in the same uh, premises uh, or a member of his or her family too to take one example okay just let me move to the next slide. That's gone all the way back, hasn't it? So let's look at the Act in more detail. Um, the Section 81 of the Act um, is entitled Residential Tenancies. Um, in England and Wales, protection from eviction, and it's Schedule 10, 29 where the provision notices are contained. Um, so, uh, variously in the past, um, ordinarily seeking to recover possession, um, notice must be given, notice to quit protected tenancies under the Rent Act, four weeks um, for proceedings, um, uh, sorry, for four weeks under uh, Rent Act, and then between two weeks and 28 days in the assured um, tenancy and the secure tenancies under those acts. Uh, there's the opportunity uh, for the, the, um, the court having to comply um, with those um, notice provisions, but actually dispensation may be provided. The rent pact section five of the mention of eviction of back 1977 and um, now it provides for um, 
a three month a three month period again so that's common um, to replace a four week notice to quit pre previously and for the relevant period so again through to the 30th of September now be necessary to serve um, a notice of intention to commence possession proceedings at a tree tenant and um, when previously there was no requirement and fleshed out within the provisions um, of the schedule um, 29 are the details to be put down and set down so for uh, the three months uh, and the notice must uh, then describe the tenancy the address the name of the tenant and so on um, state the grounds relied upon state the date on or after which the tenant intends to start proceedings and explain the landlord is, is prohibited from relying on the notice in less three months is given. The landlord is going to have to satisfy that there has been with those provisions and only the grounds relied upon in the notice can be pursued unless permission is given. And as with secure and secure tenancies, uh, within that notice uh, provision may be dispensed with um, if it's just and equitable to do so. Um, so the established case law um, around uh, that juncture within proceedings that we many of us may be, uh, will be familiar indeed with, uh, Fernandez to take uh, the earlier case um, and Boyle. <coughs> An argument may be emerge and be used, um, seeking to argue that loss of income is a a loan is a basis for dispensation well actually it's going to be and an I would suggest um, given that the spirit of all this of course is to protect tenants from eviction in the crisis that we're um, in statutory notices um, in the relevant period um, for statutory sorry, tenants for statutory tenants are likely to be few and far between um, but the fact uh, it's not a prescribed form may mean that there's some scope to challenge the validity given that detail that is set down earlier. So moving to the Housing Act 1985, um, section 83 is amended to require three month period notice period, um, applies equally to cases um, applicable to the cases in nuisance ground uh, where previously um, Proceedings could be convinced immediately, uh, notice had to be given, of course, um, but nevertheless, the three month period is there. Similarly, in section 83 ZA of the Act, which deals with notices in relation to possession on absolute grounds for antisocial behaviour, that's amended for three months' notice. And it's just a comment, really, on this section to say, well, at the time of restrictions of liberty and potential civil unrest, for example. Surprising that that three month period has been applied. Um, although, of course, in a case, the court may dispense with the need. And again, just thinking about the themes that may emerge um, and just using a Manchester or Northwest example, the sort of headlines last week or the last few weekends of interventions of the police and not just to intervene in people's movement about what shops they're going to and so on, but actually attending house parties and barbecues and so on and so forth. Um, these are the types of things I would suggest that we may see down the other side of the crisis as it translates uh, into the court um, in on some of fact um, on a case by case basis. Things that perhaps we should be thinking ahead about, just picking up on what I'd said earlier about the injunctive relief that can still be sought immediately and, and afternoon, for example, um, if a landlord so wished to do so. Housing Act 1988, well, all of the provisions, the notice periods under Section 8 are extended, um, including the ASB grounds. Um, of course, there is the dispensation provision as with the 85 Act, um, as I'd um, already just um, mentioned before. <coughs> Section 21 is amended. Um, such that notice under the AST uh, regime and those provisions, uh, the relevant period, three months in the so-called no fault uh, move to evictions. Um, and also um, in relation to uh, other species of tenancies that we see 
or three month period, which is period, there it is, uh, into the flexible tenancies um, under the Housing Act, Section 107D, um, and indeed uh, amendments to tenancies subject to a three month notice period now, too, as well, under the Housing Act 1996. You've been able to uh, hear, um, I'm grateful to uh, Daniel for just taking over that. There was a bit of a pause, I think, on the slides, but hopefully be able to provide the overview and lead on and start to suggest some of the practical issues will emerge, the themes that we will see, and Martin is going to pick us up with that now. Thanks, Martin. Thanks very much, John, uh, for that overview. Um, what uh, I'm uh, going to do is, is pick up a, a few points from uh, the uh, the effect of the stay um, and um, thinking about uh, what lies ahead when uh, the stay comes to an end um, and uh, when hopefully we come to the end uh, of this um, uh, strange um, situation that we find ourselves in. Uh, as with um, very many of the responses uh, to the pandemic, um, what we've got is a perhaps slightly uneasy mixture of some things that are being put in um, primary legislation, uh, some things are in guidance, some things are in deemed changes to regulations, uh, some things are in um, statements made by judges, some things are in practice directions and so on. So it's a little difficult to work out where all of those fit together and, and, and um, certainly when we get to the end of the process, um, questions are going to be asked about, well, what is the status of, of things like non-statutory guidance that's been given? And it's 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 not just in, in housing law that this uh, problem's arisen, it's obviously anyone who's following uh, the problems about uh, when you can and can't leave your home is aware of the same problems about the division between advice, guidance, legislation, and so on. Um, but I, I want to start with um, some guidance. There's a couple of documents that have been put out. Um, I, I, I've put them up here on uh, the slide. Um, one is general guidance for landlords and tenants. Uh, the other is uh, about renting. The renting one doesn't really say very much. It paraphrases uh, some of the provisions, but doesn't um, give you much more by way of guidance. Uh, the general document um, is a little bit more interesting because it's pretty prescriptive. And if I can, um, hopefully I'll have some, no, Daniel had said that I was um, in control and I am I am in control still um, because the, uh, the the guidance here, uh, this is from the COVID-19 guidance. Uh, and you can see that it, it, it's pretty prescriptive stuff. Um, it's advising landlords, strongly advising them not to commence new notices. Um, uh, without a very good reason to do so, and again, strongly advising landlords not to commence or continue eviction proceedings uh, without a very good reason to do so. Now, uh, that's the sort of language that we're familiar with um, in statutory guidance, um, and it's the kind of thing where in public law terms it means that a landlord um, has to have a, as the guidance suggests, a good reason for departing from it. Um, it's non-statutory guidance, we'll have to see what happens um, later on, where it um, it is taken uh, when we have to consider proceedings that have been started uh, and are being pursued. Um, but uh, so just leaving that for, for, for a moment, if I can move on to the next slide, um, which uh, deals with um, the the stay, because of course, if you do start proceedings now, it's going to be subject to the stay. Uh, John has, has introduced this, so I just want to um, look into it in a little bit more detail. Um, it, applies to um, all proceedings of possession under part 55 um, and it says proceedings seeking to enforce an order for possession by a warrant or writ of possession stay for 90 days um, and it's going to end in, in 90 days time although uh, obviously there'd, there'd be nothing stopping uh, the court from uh, extending the period of the stay. Um, generally where you've got to stay it's open to uh, the parties to apply to to lift it um, and this is a slightly odd situation, though, because it, it, it's not a stay that's been imposed in individual proceedings. It's a stay that's um, been imposed generally across all proceedings. And so um, there, there's no reason why um, there shouldn't be um, power to make an application to lift the stay in an individual case, or in the only case that has so far considered this, that wasn't the route 
that the court chose. Um, but uh, in principle, um, it, it might be possible for a landlord to uh, apply to lift the stay for some reason. Uh, and it might be that you might want to do it not in order to get the hearing on, but in order to, to give you authority to, to progress the case. If, for example, you're, you're going to have a hearing uh, shortly after the stay comes to an end. Uh, can we go on to the next slide, please? Um, first point is, is what, what, what's, what's the effect of the stay? Um, and uh, it's the, the, the Grant and Dawn meets here, which it really sets out what the, uh, the effect of the stay is. It's also set out in the glossary to, to the White Book. But it is, um, as it suggests, it freezes the proceedings. And so it's um, everything um, that is, is required to be done by either party um, is, um, is prevented or, or stopped uh, during the, um, the period of the stay. And uh, then when the stay is lifted, you, you, you pick off uh, at, at the moment you left off. Um, so in principle, um, if, you have, if you were due to um, exchange statements the day that the um, stay started, you then have to exchange them the, the day after it ends. Um, in principle, if you had a trial, um, on the, the day after the stay started, um, your, your trial would be uh, something which, which would be effective the day after the stay comes to an end, but of course by then the listing would have, have ended. Um, so um, you, you, you would have to have something done to, to get the case relisted. But uh, that, that, that in principle is the effect of the stay, and that raises various difficulties. If we can move on to the next slide. Um, uh, but uh, but so, uh, well, uh, before I come on, come on to the difficulties raised by um, the work you can do during a stay, just just if we cover what's what's covered by the proceedings or by the stay, um, it includes, it seems, um, proceedings that are covered by Section eighty nine of the Housing Act, which, as you know, uh, limits the discretion of the court uh, to uh, stay or postpone. Um, giving up a possession on mandatory grounds or in cases where there's no protection. And that includes staying on the order or staying any execution. And, and that does raise the question about um, whether the stay is lawful um, in all circumstances, because in a case where possession's already been granted, uh, the court by section 89 doesn't have power um, to uh, stay. Uh, the execution of possession. Um, and yet that is the effect of the stay that's been granted. Um, and uh, the explanation may be that the, the stay is, is simply an administrative act, which is um, enabling the court to manage its business because it simply couldn't deal with everything. Um, and that's the nature of the stay. And it's not suspending ex execution in the individual case, but um, it, it may be a point um, that is there to be taken. Um, although, again, uh, if a landlord wanted to say that the stay was a breach of Section 89, it may be their remedy would be to apply for judicial review uh, rather than say, well, we can go ahead and, and apply for a warrant anyway. But there's a separate question also whether it covers warrants that have already been issued. Um, because the courts have been um, issuing lists of, of priorities about um, work that, that must be done as a matter of priority. Um, and every version of this, and I think the latest one's the 15th of April, every version of this uh, list as part of the work that must be done, uh, these applications to stay enforcement of existing possession orders. So that seems to assume that the court thinks that there is still some business um, that it is outstanding to be done in, in relation to possession orders. Um, one explanation may be it's just there for uh, the sake of caution, uh, because landlords might blunder ahead anyway, trying to enforce, uh, and therefore that's got to be brought to court. Or, or it might be um, that uh, the, the stay doesn't cover cases where you've already issued a warrant, because then you, you're, you're not, you're, you're sort of outside the Section 55 process, uh, which is what the subject of the stay is, and, and, and it is more an administrative act. Um, enforcing that warrant, although you can apply to have it stayed. Um, but it's a bit of a grey area there. Um, the state doesn't cover injunctions, um, as I think uh, John pointed out, uh, and uh, that, that's um, led very quickly to, to a case that was um, covering this very recently. Um, the UCL hospitals um, had a patient um, 
um, in a, a bedroom in the um, hospital. Um, she refused to be discharged um, and her bed was unsurprisingly really virgin. Uh, the trust terminated her license um, and they started off bringing proceedings for possession. Uh, and it came before the judge. He said, well, what about the stay? Um, and the judge then drew the party's attention though, to the power um, to grant an injunction um, in aid of uh, a, an owner's right to restrain trespass. Um, and uh, the judgment of Mr. Justice Chamberlain went through um, a, a number of potential defences, all based on public law grounds, um, and said none of those were arguable. And in any event, in the current circumstances, the balance of convenience favoured an interim injunction. Um, and so um, granted the injunction. Now, obviously, that's a very exceptional case. Um, and by no means is this going to be a, a general escape route uh, for landlords who are caught by the stay here to say, well, we're not going for possession, we're going for an interim injunction anyway. But what about some of the cases where um, there, there isn't statutory protection? One, one example might be people who are being accommodated on an interim basis in, in homelessness circumstances. Um, another example might be people who have um, lost their accommodation because they've, they've lost their employment and that they're in um, tight accommodation um, or, or there might be various other um, cases where, where people don't have a, any statutory protection and in those circumstances might landlords want to apply for, for injunctions equally um, if a landlord can't bring a claim on antisocial behavior grounds um, could they bring an injunction and of course in, in those circumstances if they did bring an injunction um, that, that wouldn't bring an end to the tenancy so that would create various difficulties there but so so that there may be um, a, an increase in the use of injunctions or attempted use of injunctions, but, but uh, certainly UCL doesn't open the door to them being used generally. Just one other point on stays, you can go on to the next slide, please. Which is what about costs? Because uh, as we said earlier, um, the um, stay stops all action um, and therefore it means that you don't have to carry on working, but at the same time, it may well be reasonable and proportionate for you to carry on working. Uh, particularly if you've got um, something that needs to be done immediately after the state comes to an end. Um, and uh, so you can still incur costs and have them recoverable between the parties um, or, or on a legal aid assessment. Um, and that doesn't stop just because the stay is in force. It's all going to be subject to reasonableness and proportionality. So, of course, if you have got something which is coming up for trial, um, you, you'll need to be sure that you're acting reasonably and incurring all those costs. So you'll need to explore the possibility of settlement before you do that in the course of the stay. And one other, one other option would be to apply to the court to lift the stay just for the purpose of getting on with that work. Um, but uh, it may well be that the parties could reach some kind of agreement along those lines. Moving to the next slide, please. Uh, I just want to consider briefly what, what, what's going to happen after the stay um, and, and after the, the lockdown period ends, because although um, the Coronavirus Act has um, made amendments to increase the notice period and, and although as we've seen guidance has been given discouraging landlords from serving notices or, or bringing proceedings, the Act is um, completely silent uh, about what protection it's going to give to people um, who found themselves um, in difficulties in, in rent arrears. It might not be rent just rent arrears, there might be other um, problems that have arisen that are related to coronavirus. Uh, and there's no protection in the Act, um, for example, by amending primary legislation to extend reasonableness or to um, increase um, protection on, on discretionary grounds or, or to, for example, give a, a broader discretion than the one we now have in, in, in Section 89. Um, none of those um, changes that have been made, that there are um, there's quite a lot of interest in, in, in trying to get Parliament to pass um, emergency legislation along those lines, but nothing's been done so far. Some help's been given with rent. Um, local housing allowance, as, as you know, was increased by 1.7% um, at the beginning of this year, um, after many years of, of in effect, being frozen. Um, and uh, in response to the coronavirus pandemic, what's happened is that uh, it's been increased now back to the 30th percentile. Um, but that's only for this financial year, uh, and it's only a partial 
solution to the problem because uh, a great many people are now finding themselves in situations where they're having to apply uh, for um, universal credit uh, when they wouldn't have done otherwise and where they're already in accommodation uh, which is um, above the 30th percentile where they can't be expected to move uh, and so there are going to be very significant shortfalls even if people are on full mobile housing amounts and of course that's stacking up rent arrears for the um, remaining period um, and the, the only other um, measure that, that seems to be uh, being taken to um, anticipate the kind of protection that's going to be needed is, is there's a suggestion that the pre-action protocol is going to be applied to uh, extend to private landlords but um, that th there are various announcements on that uh, and I think the announcement that introduced this stay uh, suggested that was going to be done as far as I no revised protocol yet and, and I haven't seen a draft on either um, I, I don't know if other people have um, uh, are ahead of, 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 of me on that but uh, that's uh, as far as I'm aware there's been no such um, document yet so if we can move on um, some of the, um, the the problems that may arise um, one issue may be uh, if you've got someone where a, a notice needed to be served um, have they got the right notice um, and John um, highlighted the points about the, the the new notices that need to be given on new period of notice um, and the coronavirus act has been approached that in a rather odd way uh, what it's done is it, it hasn't produced new prescribed forms at the moment what you've got are all the prescribed forms are, are, are made under regulations um, under the parent acts um, and what the act what the coronavirus act does is instead of making provision for new prescribed forms, what it does is it deems the existing forms to be read as including wording that incorporates the extended notice periods. So I, I, I'll give you an example for, for one, which is about the secure tenancies, where uh, the, the existing notices have to be read in relation to notices served under Section 83 of the Housing Act. Um, uh, during the relevant period as if and then the um, notice periods are, are, are included and that the same drafting method applies to assured and short shorthold tenancies and what the landlord's got to do is serve a notice in the specified form or in the form substantially to the like effect um, and, and so what you've got to do is serve a form which is substantially the same as the form with the deemed new wording and you might have the old form and um, add in the words or cross out the relevant words um, but if we can just uh, go to the next slide, please. Thanks. Um, what's happened is that although the, the forms haven't been amended, the government have um, put up um, forms on the website which uh, incorporate the deemed wording, and both of them contain a form which doesn't come from the statute which says the forms have been changed to reflect new legislation which came to force on 26th of March and should be used by landlords up to 30th September 2020. And uh, it seems to me that there are possibly two points that may end up being taken about these forms. Uh, I think both of them probably bad points. One is that landlords may argue uh, that because they have used the wrong form, they've used the old form, they should nonetheless be entitled to rely on the deemed wording and say, they'd say well, it's as if the form um, had the wording that was there that the statute says should be in it. Uh, that I think would be a completely mistaken point because the what, what's been changed is the form that the landlord has to uh, be has to replicate, not not the, the form that the landlord serves. The second point that might be taken is that because of this new wording, which has been included, which isn't statutorily authorised, uh, tenants might say, "Well, it's not a, it's not a in the statutory form." I think, again, that's probably a bad point because the courts tend to take a very pragmatic view of these things and say, well, as long as you knew what the form was saying, then um, you, you can't take advantage of some technical defect. But I do wonder whether there might be some mileage in it where, where you've got to, that, that, that the form's got to be used by landlords up to the 30th of September 2020. And what if you've got one that's served um, either shortly before that um, in which case, um, the uh, are you still using it when it expires after the 30th September? And what if landlords carry on using it after the 30th September? What's going to happen then? Or should landlords go back to the old forms? 
Um, so if you had one which was usurped after the 30th of September, but still had this wording, um, then a tenant might be able to say, well, look, you, you, I, I was misled because the, the form said it was the wrong one. Um, so th there might still be some points on, on that, um, even if these forms are being used. And finally, if we go on to the last slide, um, other defences, it's, it's a little difficult without the Act having been amended. Obviously, for discretionary grounds, um, the um, courts um, may well um, be sympathetic to arguments that the people who have been put into financial difficulty um, should be given time to pay. Uh, the problem is going to come with, with mandatory grounds. Um, and we may have a resurgence of um, public law Article 8 defences, uh, in particular the guidance I showed you earlier, uh, may be something that um, uh, landlords who are subject to public law will have to take into account and, and have to give good reason for departing from it. Um, then there might be cases where there's been some kind of agreement or forbearance, um, and you might find that you're uh, being asked to give advice about that at this stage. Um, if there is an agreement not to um, enforce, um, or, or a promise not to enforce, then there may well be an estoppel or a, a collateral contract to that effect. Um, one point, I suppose a practice point, is to make sure that if you are involved in uh, agreeing something of that kind, then you want to make sure that any agreement isn't one, which has the effect that if uh, one of the instalments is missed, um, then the entire amount still falls due. Um, rather, it would have to be one where if you miss an instalment, then you have to pay that instalment, uh, but uh, you, you're not then liable for the full amount. Um, and the other possibility is that uh, certainly if the pre-action protocol gets extended to um, the private rented sector, um, then um, if there's been a failure to follow it, um, then there'll be no reason why the court shouldn't adjourn the proceedings. And again, the court's likely to be deluged by cases um, after the stay comes to an end. And it would be entirely justifiable for the court to say, well, look, we've got so many cases. Um, we're prepared to, we're, we're perfectly entitled to prioritize them according to whether or not you follow the protocol. Um, but uh, it, this is obviously going to be an area to watch because um, it, there may well be some act, some legislative activity between now and the period, the end of the room period, uh, with Parliament uh, extending some kind of protection, um, either formally um, through um, the Act or, or informally, as has tended to be the case, um, through guidance or practice direction or something of that kind. So we're going to think now going to questions. I, I've, um, I've been seeing as um, this has been going on that there's chat, which I've unfortunately not been able to see the whole thing, but I can see there's a lot of, uh, a lot of questions which may already have been answered, or perhaps we can pick up on some of those. Uh, shall I hand back to uh, Daniel or Jim, who are chairing this? Yeah, I think um, myself and Daniel can um, have a look at uh, the questions that we've had so far, and, and perhaps John and Martin can also chip in. I'm just having a look at the questions here. Um, the, the first question is from James MacDonald, who says there have been two confirmed cases in London on the 2nd of April and in Brighton on the 26th of March of landlords using violence to gain entry to commercial properties in which squatters were present inside without a writ or warrant of possession, contrary to Section 6.1 of the Criminal Law Act. The police were called and did nothing to stop the landlords and even help them remove people from the squats. What action can be taken by squatters in this situation? What action could be taken regarding these two instances? Um, what do we think about that, members of the panel? Any ideas? Well, Luke, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, well, one, one thought that I had, which is, which is one that's been um, ticking over in my mind for a little while because it, it, this uh, mirrors a more general problem with the police and unlawful evictions that you often have tenants who are um, in the middle of being unlawfully evicted and call the police and the police turn up and say well it's a civil matter we're not doing anything about it um, this seems to be a more extreme version of, of police error in that in that case in that there's an actual uh, positive assistance um, there was 
back in, I think, the early 2000s, a case uh, of Cowan and the Chief Constable of Avon and Somerset, in which um, a tenant in, that, in, in those circumstances uh, tried to bring a claim in negligence against the, um, against the police uh, for failing to prevent an unlawful eviction, and that was unsuccessful. Uh, because the Court of Appeal said that it wouldn't be in the public interest uh, to delay the response to an emergency call while seeking information about landlord and tenant law. Um, however, since then, there was, uh, there was a case in 2010, I think it was reported in legal action, I think it was the first instance county court decision in Norton and Whittle and the Chief Constable of Greater Manchester, in which the police which had... Which I think was John's case. Yeah. Um, that John Hobson was involved in, so I'm sure he'll correct me in a moment at, at, on my description of it. But as I understand it, there a, a claim for trespass was was successful against the police in circumstances where they'd actively assisted the landlord with the eviction. That's not going to be um, so much of an assistance in the case of squatters because the squatters wouldn't have a a uh, cause of action in trespass over the land that they're themselves trespassing on. Um, however. The, in relation to another way in which the, the law's moved on since Cowan, it's worth noting that although the, I think the judgment in Cowan is after the coming into force of the Human Rights Act, um, the facts in Cowan were before the Human Rights Act. And so it may possibly um, be the case now, uh, particularly given any arguments um, about a positive duty on the state under Article 8 to, to uh, assist respect for right for home, that that there might be an argument that could be constructed on that basis, possibly. Um, I well, I suppose although the police wouldn't be liable in trespass um, in a in a squatter case, um, trespass land, they they they, they, would, they could well be joint tort fees on trespass goods, couldn't they? Uh, yeah. Interference, um, and and so if they if they help the landlord evict. Yeah. Um, I mean, trespass to the person as well. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So. Uh, can I just interject and say, Caitlin, um, could you put your question in the Q&A section so that we know uh, where everything is rather than in the chat section? Um, is there anything else we want to add to question one? I mean, presumably that there's no question of the squatters getting back in by a court proceedings. I think that's pretty unlikely myself, but unlikely. does everyone agree? Um, the second uh, question, was from anonymous i think uh, would it be possible for the court to lift the stay under practice direction 51z on its own initiative uh, both parties presuming anonymous's case were surprised to receive a notice of pre-trial review by telephone at the end of april in a possession matter and i'm slightly concerned the court is expecting the trial at the end of may to happen remotely as well um, I think, Dan, you, you uh, had uh, some thoughts on that. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the only point really was to, to say that the case of Beauvale and the Secretary of State um, that's referred to in Martin's slides um, deals with the question of the extent to which a judge can depart from a practice direction. Um, and very briefly summarised what the court decided in that case was that a judge couldn't take um, couldn't take action that would negate the effect of a practice direction altogether. Um, so I think in that case it was about it was about saying that the, the, ju the judge in that particular court wasn't just wasn't going to apply um, a practice direction that had been brought into force, but that it, a practice direction was only a general um, direction and it could be departed from in an individual case where that was appropriate. But I would have thought um, in, in those kind of circumstances, the judge would at least have to have a proper reason. Um, it, it couldn't just be on the basis that they didn't like the effect of the practice direction or against disregard it. I would have thought that there would need to be something slightly stronger than that. But, I mean, I think in practical terms, um, it may be that the judge has just uh, overlooked the stay and may need a, a little reminder about that. Um, I mean, obviously, it, this, we, we're all realistic as, um, you know, defence lawyers in housing possession cases. Often a delay is, is, um, is quite good tactically because it allows us 
either to you know get our case together or um, you know allows the client a bit more time to get things sorted out. Um, so you know I think this can be used to to an advantage. Um, obviously, th th there's a different question about the concerns uh, about after uh, the stay period and, and what sort of shape people are going to be in. Um, but I, you know, if it if it assists your client, anonymous. I would be um, contacting the court and, and reminding them about the stay provisions uh, mm. and say, you know, should we really be going ahead with this hearing? Just, just to add to that, it, it's following on from the point I made earlier about Beauvel, I found the paragraph now, which is paragraph 70 of that judgment, which says that mm. parties are entitled to start from the position that the relevant rules and practice directions will apply to their case. The onus will be on the party seeking a different form of process and indeed on the judge who may have his own motion wish to exercise his case management powers to demonstrate that the case is outside the norm so that's if, if judges are saying well look i'm, I'm just not going to going to abide by the stay that's the paragraph to refer them to okay great so let's have a look oh, lizzie lizzie blacklock says where a trial has been listed during this stay should we wait to hear from the court to notify us that it's being vacated or should we make, be making an application to court to vacate? It's a good point. I had a trial after the enforcement of the stay where the judge wanted to deal with it by telephone, even though an Equality Act defence had been raised. Any views? Well, I thought in, in the first instance, you simply inquire of the court that, you know, for them to confirm that the stay applies to it. Um, you, you probably don't need to make a formal application because hopefully they will write back and say, of course, we're, we're abiding by the stay. If they say no, then, then you'll... Well, if they say no, there's then a slightly odd situation that, this, that you, you, you'd strictly out speaking, I suppose. You need to lift the stay in order to make the application to vacate the hearing. But uh, the, the, um, but the, uh, I think the, the, the reality is you simply make the application to vacate. Yeah. We've got, we've got uh, another question uh, uh, from Caitlin uh, McClare. He says, and, and this is a good point actually, um, an increasing number of students uh, are asking about rent in their student accommodation, which they've had to move out of, um, because uh, presumably moving home and whatnot, to be with the family while they're quarantined. Uh, but they've still got contracts till the summer. Um, I mean, my initial view is that the, the, the rent will still be due uh, but there must be some, you know, depending on the university or the accommodation provider, there must be some provision for, for trying to negotiate uh, themselves out of that. Because uh, it seems, seems very unfair if the accommodation provider is continuing to charge rent. Um, I don't know what other people think. I mean, there is a, a, a line of authority that um, deals with situations where... Um, you, you can't, you, it's, it's like frustration, but, but not quite. Um, whether, if, if it's actually illegal for you to perform the contract, um, then, um, the, uh, then, then some obligations can sometimes be suspended. There, there's a, a line of authority that go back to cases from um, during wartime, or when it, it's illegal, yeah. that sort of thing. Um, and I know that that argument's been used for some commercial leases or is being used where, where what's being said is well look the government's saying we, we, it's illegal for us to open our business uh, and that therefore we should be relieved of the rent during that period um I, it's possible i suppose that an argument of that kind could be deployed for students if what's being said is well that your your um your, your place of residence is um your your home non um studying address um, and you'd be breaching the regular, you'd be breaching the act and the regulations if you uh, were to spend time in the student accommodation. I mean, the trouble is that 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 doesn't make it impossible for you to pay your rent, no. um, and and so it, it's not it's not a strict um, frustration type argument, but but it's a situation where what you've got is that the purpose of the letting has now become illegal uh, yeah. during the period. Then there may be an argument that you can suspend the rent. Anything to add, anyone else? Well, I, I think a lot of that, if, if there is a possible argument to run, a lot's going to depend on the nature of the particular letting, because obviously a lot of students are just going to have um, short-term tenancies with landlords that aren't 
they're not specifically renting them as student accommodation. Um, and in those cases, it's much more difficult because the landlord can say, well, there's nothing stopping you continuing to live in whatever town it is that you happen to be studying in. Yeah. You're just choosing now that your university's closed to go back and, and live at your holiday address. Whereas I think in relation to accommodation that's specifically left to student accommodation, then, then that's obviously going to be more fertile potential ground for running an argument like that. I mean, I think the, the obvious advice, is, if you're giving advice, is pay the rent. But, um, it, uh, you know, that, that may not be possible. And, and I think what we're facing, I mean, the, the question that was put forward earlier on about unlawful eviction, I think that's something that we have to bear in mind that uh, there are going to be more. I mean, I've had a couple already of <coughs> unlawful evictions where landlords simply frustrated because they're not getting the rent. And uh, so I think that's that's another area that potentially we'll be we'll be doing another webinar just to, <coughs> to remind people of the, um, the the unlawful eviction uh, remedies that are available, really. Um, and the type of damages that may be obtained, because I think that's that's going to be increasingly an area that uh, that is going to develop as private landlords get more and more frustrated about the situation. Um, I think we've got uh, another case, another question. I have a case that I would like to settle. It's a possession case with counterclaim. Can the claim, I think that means stay, be lifted so that a settlement can be dealt with by the court? It would be good for the client to have the case settled now as she's doing really well with rent and rent arrears payments. Yes. Yes, I think. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's correct that it's probably technically caught by the stay, but nobody, neither party nor the court, if a settlement's been reached, is going to quibble, nor, nor would it be outside the spirit of the stay, um, which is to prevent possession proceedings from, from progressing. Um, whereas obviously if they can be settled and, and disposed of then then that's in everybody's interest. Coming in in dribs and drabs now. Oh no, that's it. That's it. I think that's the one I've just read. Yeah. So any more questions? If you've got them, fire them through now. We'll wait a couple of minutes just to see. Participants. Either that or we'll see the attendees suddenly drain away. Yeah. Sorry about the um, the sound quality of the uh, the talk. It's obviously a new uh, medium that we're, we're um, getting used to as well. And um, obviously, if, you know, because John's in Manchester, we, there was a bit of a sound issue earlier on, I think. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll work on that and ensure that, uh, you know, it, you, you get the full sound on the next occasion. Um, if you've got any, oh, there's another question come through. Would the stay apply to injunctions which are being heard together with possession claims? I don't. I don't think that they. I don't think it would do. Um, or at least, if if it technically did, then it would be very easy to get the court to uh, lift the stay in respect of the injunction part. Um, yeah. But I think it, the the wording of the practice direction is is explicit that it's not intended to catch injunctions, so it may not even apply in the first place. And if it does. Um, the court will lift it. Yeah. And some more questions have come in. Uh, can the court deal with an existing re-entry application during this COVID period? That's from Jamil, right. That's an interesting question. Well, and, that, I, mean, um, I think it, it may it, be it, a case that I'm dealing with. Sorry, <laughs> go on, Dan. My, my initial thought is that it, on the face of it, it's caught by the stay in that if you're making an application within an application within part 55 proceedings, which arguably a re-entry application is because it's a post judgment application. But again, it's going to be one of those cases which clearly isn't intended to be caught by the stay. And so a court would, uh, you could very easily make a case to say, well, even if I'm technically caught by this, clearly it's in, it's in accordance with the, the purpose of the stay that, that it should be lifted in this case, because the stay is about stopping people being homeless um, during this period. And, and therefore a re-entry application is intended to do that and should be dead. And arguably that the, um, the re-entry by its nature means that the evictions already happened. So, um, 
you know, you could approach it from the point that, you know, that the, the stay is really seeking to address um, not uh, people being put on the streets rather than people trying to get back out, back, you know, into accommodation. So um, I don't know. I mean, it's, I think I'd, I'd be very surprised if, if um, the courts refuse to hear that application. Um, but we will see. And I'll, I'll report back once we've, we've brought that. There's another well, question come through. No, Sorry, Martin. A, no, no, I was just saying in, in substance, it, it's, a, it's like an injunction. Um, it, yeah. it, it would have unlawful eviction, isn't it? Yeah. Um, really would be entitled to go ahead. So anyway, we've got okay. another question. There's another question, which is, are the slides able, available after the webinar? <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking of sharing out my colleagues who are unable to attend. Yes. Rachel uh, will ensure that the slides are available. Um, I'm not sure where she is at the moment. But in, fact, the, the, yeah, in fact, I think the entire... I'll send the, I'll send the slides and the recording to everyone that attended today to pass to colleagues. That's fine. Okay. Great. I think we're probably... Um, we've answered all of the questions, I think. Uh, as I say, if there's any burning issues that people want to raise, uh, please feel free to email us um, after the event if something occurs to you. And thank you very much for attending. And uh, as I say, we'll be in touch. We're going to do more webinars, uh, first of all, on homelessness, I think, next week. Uh, so we'll be in touch about that. And um, stay well, everyone. Thanks for attending. <laughs>